Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, a very, very warm welcome to this evening's lecture. Um, I'm Claire Taylor. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at the University, and it's my absolute delight to be hosting uh, this research lecture this evening as part of our ongoing series. So if you're interested in, in hearing more uh, from different areas of the university, then do look out for future events as well. It's fantastic that we have Tegan Briley Solis here with us this evening. Uh, you can see the title of her lecture there, which is actually the, um, the subject of her doctoral studies of her PhD. But a little bit of background uh, in terms of my sort of uh, personal connection with Tegan, because I first came across Tegan quite early on when I arrived at the university nearly seven years ago. I think you were in your second year of your undergraduate degree at the yes. time. And I thought, hurrah, a real life student who I can talk to and who's engaging and who's interested in what's going on. And Tegan was always one of those people who would you know, put her hand up to engage with stuff, to get involved with stuff, who was genuinely interested in the university in making a difference uh, and getting involved, which uh, for me as a senior leader is a gift, I have to say, a real gift. So I've really watched Tegan with interest as she's progressed through her undergraduate studies, her postgraduate studies, her doctorate, congratulations, Dr. Tegan Briley Solis, and has also been an incredibly influential driving force, particularly in relation to our work to become a trauma and ACEs informed university. The great thing about Tegan is that um, what you see is what you get. Tegan is totally authentic. Uh, when you talk to her, she talks with um, authenticity in terms of her compassionate approach and her real belief in a, an approach that is rooted in um, kindness, but also in impact. So we have here a young woman who is fantastic in terms of research power and you know, good scholarly work, which has uh, incredible foundations, great impact, great work, but also an edge that brings uh, a, a, a realism to her work and that kind of applied aspect, which is so, so important for a university like ours. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Tegan Briley Solis, who's going to talk to us for a little while this evening, and then we'll take some questions towards the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm so, so grateful that you're all here, um, and I'm excited to tell you about my research. So um, I wanted to start the session with a quote that I love, and I don't know if any of you have heard it before, you may have, um, but it's um, from Ram Dass, and he said that when you go into the woods, you see all different kinds of trees, and some are bent, some are gnarled, some are evergreen, all different kinds, and you look at the tree and you allow it, and you understand why it might be a certain way. So maybe it didn't get enough water, maybe it didn't get enough light, but you still appreciate it for its beauty. You still know that it's enough and that it, can, it has um, power. So what Ramdas says is that you should practice turning people into trees, and hopefully by the end of the talk you will understand why I have used this quote. Um, but there's another story that I want to tell you tonight, and this story is going to be cut from the recording because it's my own personal story. Participants, um, both children and service providers, whose stories and spirits and strengths have really shaped this research into what it is. And to the service providers, some of which are in the room, thank you for your ongoing interest, your willingness to assist in any way, and the kindness and compassion which you demonstrated to me whilst I was in your presence. I am eternally grateful to everything that you've done for me. I'm also eternally grateful to the children who spoke to me and, and shared me, um, shared their stories with me and just allowed me a little bit of a glimpse into their lives. Thank you also to the people and organisations who have opened so many doors to wonderful opportunities for me um, because there have been so many on this journey. This lecture is also for you and this lecture is for everybody who has attended tonight because I'm really grateful. So, I wanted to tell you the story of my research, and you'll notice that there's a nautical theme to the research, uh, to the um, lecture tonight, and all will be revealed 
just after this slide where I'm going to show you the animation of navigating the storm, uh, which is nautical. So uh, this is why it's called The Voyage. Now, I started my journey in 2018, and when I first started, I originally was interested in trauma-informed interventions within youth justice, but what I soon came to realise was that actually there wasn't anything speci any tr um, specific trauma-informed interventions. What people were saying was it was more about the culture of the organisation, so that is what I decided to um, look at instead. These are some of the, um, I would say, defining moments within my journey. And there was a few that I remember, but these were some of the moments that really made the journey special for me. Um, so I took part in the visualize, uh, visualizing research competition and I created, I mean, I'm not going to win any photography awards, but um, I created the image um, that you can see on the screen, and I called it the Serene Storm of Inn, and I wanted to explain how um, trauma and um, ex adverse experiences can feel and be so different for us, just like bodies of water. And as human beings, we are made up mainly of water, so I thought that analogy was quite fitting. Um, and that really led to... Um, what I did next at the ASOB conference in 2019. So I was asked to present, and I had never presented before. I hated the idea of presenting. I just really got very nervous about public speaking. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, how I've got 10 minutes now, so how am I going to explain this piece of research in 10 minutes and make it interesting and engaging? And everybody else is so good at presenting, and they just seem to do it so naturally. Um, but I do remember hearing people say that they, they felt really nervous, like they, they could do a really good job, but they felt really nervous on, on the inside. Um, and so it got me thinking that actually we all experience things so differently. It doesn't, what we show on the outside may not be reflective of what we're really feeling on the inside. And so I used metaphors again. I used the water analogy um, and that was the start of Navigating the Storm. And then a year later, I did the Open House for Research conference, and that's where it really took off. Um, thank you to Mandy Robbins for the idea to do the animation, because without you, it would not, have, it would not be where it is now. Um, so then, steering in a new direction. Um, as I said, I steered my research into a new direction when I realised that there wasn't um, specific trauma-informed interventions that I could research. But also, I steered it in a new direction in 2020 because I started my data collection. I started to interview children and carry out focus groups with staff. But then the lockdown happened and I wasn't able to interview children anymore. Um, and, or indeed uh, carry out focus groups with staff in person. So I had to really think about what I was going to do. And I wanted to be quite... Um, I wanted to use a trauma-informed lens to do this piece of research. And so I really thought hard about how I was going to do this, and it took um, a lot of support from my supervisors to, to really pave the way for my research going forward. And I came to this decision to not interview any more children because I didn't think that it was appropriate to interview children on such a sensitive topic when they may not have the support around them. Um, and to do that virtually as well, I didn't know where they would be. Um, so I, I didn't interview as many children as I originally envisaged interviewing. But I did, um, however, manage to interview and conduct focus groups online with service providers, so I was able to do that virtually. But it did steer my research into a bit of a new direction. And what I also did was I ensured I adhered to the 10 trauma-informed principles coined by Elliot and colleagues in 2005 during my data collection. And these principles were adapted for um, research with victims of sexual violence by Campbell and colleagues in 2009. So I also have followed that and adapted as appropriate for this piece of research. So I really led with the awareness that anybody can be a victim of um, trauma. And um, that meant that I needed to apply this um, principle, all these principles, to focus groups with service providers as well as the interviews that I was carrying out with children. And this included, for example, understanding the coping mechanisms identified by participants and the continuing impact which trauma might have on their lives um, going through it, their involvement with the criminal justice system. Um, another principle is to emphasise individual strengths and resiliency, which I attempted to do through the use of active listening and also picking up on, on individual strengths when they were talking to me in the research. And I found, particularly when I was talking to children, um, they, they weren't, didn't always talk about themselves very nicely. Um, but there was just little snippets that they would say now and then um, that really demonstrated what their strengths were. And it could be 
they were really amazing big brother to their younger siblings or they were really caring in school, all of those kinds of things. Um, and I also tried to ensure that the environment that the interviews took place in um, felt safe because being safe and feeling safe are two very different things. We can all be safe in this room right now, but not all of us will feel safe. So I really wanted to ensure that everybody felt safe during the um, data collection. So now I'm going to uh, play the animation for you. <coughs> um, and this animation is just a way to explain what trauma and trauma-informed culture is and how we can start to apply a trauma-informed lens. So this animation um, is, is the reason why the um, theme is nautical tonight, so it will all make sense once you watch the animation. I think I'll have to... We are all navigating life, just like boats navigate water. When our life feels calm and manageable, the water gently laps the side of our boat. When life feels tough, the water is a stormy ocean with terrifying waves crashing all around. Some of us will be scared to face this storm, but manage to brace ourselves to do so, while others will feel anxious and may struggle to cope, fearing that one big wave could destroy them. As the storm passes, we focus on our recovery, but this is not always so simple. The experience of such an event may leave some to question their safety, anticipating another storm which will carry them out to sea again. The boat that we use to navigate the waters in life adjusts as we grow and our circumstances change. We might start life as a luxurious cruise liner, while others would compare themselves to a small sailboat or even a simple plank of wood. Each vessel is unique, based on experiences, relationships and self-identity. To the outside world, a boat can look worn. The boat may have a few leaks or a broken sail, but we may feel happy, content and safe on board. Another boat may look safe and sturdy, but there are various issues on board or below deck that can't be seen. The water can also be a treacherous place, and some of us may have found ourselves in predatory waters for some time. Even moving to safer, gentler waters, mistrust can prevail and some of us remain on guard. Our adverse reactions are often rooted in our previous experiences and remain difficult to ignore. After a challenging period, it is helpful to seek safety with a chance to be guided and supported by others and to rest and repair any damage. Without help to dock, we may be deprived of an opportunity to take time to revive our confidence and feel forced to remain in choppy waters, struggling to feel safe and lost without help. Distress flares equip our boats to save us, but they are only useful if we are able to recognise danger, know when to ask for help, and know how to use them. They can also be misused with constant threats perceived in every situation and in a constant state of high alert. It is important to use our anchor of resilience, which gives us control when things get tough, helps us to stay on course and learn from our experiences. It is not our fault if we struggle to use our anchors. We have little control over its weight. Our vessels are also equipped with a trauma-informed telescope. This allows us to look through a lens at an individual, their boat and the water surrounding them and begin to understand their own specific situation. Through this, we can connect and respond with kindness in a safe and trustworthy way. A collaborative, trauma-informed approach can teach us to recognise that each separate journey is unique. It is important to understand, however, that regardless of experience and adversity, we all have strengths and can go on to successfully navigate the storms that may come our way. So hopefully that sets the scene nicely for the rest of the talk, um, which I have kept very nautical. Um, that animation is available on YouTube in English and Welsh, so please, if you're from any other organisation and you'd like to use it,
please feel free to use it. I'm more than happy for you to contact me to get the link if you feel like it would be useful. Um, and yeah, we're, we're happy for you to use the animation to help. If, hopefully it, it does. Okay, so before I um, tell you about the findings from my research, I wanted to just um, highlight three, point, three um, points that are going to come up quite a bit. So I wanted to first talk about trauma and um, just give you a little bit more information about what trauma is. So the term trauma holds Greek origins, meaning wound, and a metaphoric spin was placed on it by um, Freud to explain how the mind can be wounded too. However, a universal definition for trauma doesn't exist. And this might be because um, trauma can be thought of as a medical term. It can also be thought of as a biopsychosocial term as well. So there isn't a, a readily presented definition of trauma. And also trauma is subjective. So various definitions do exist in an attempt to um, understand a complex and broad area. Generally, trauma is considered an event or set of circumstances which are harmful in some way and leaves an imprint within an individual. Um, I often use the SAMHSA definition to um, explain what trauma is, but we also have a definition in uh, Wales now, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about in just a, a moment. But the SAMHSA definition is an event, series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional or spiritual well-being. Um, there are many different types of trauma, which I won't go into detail of what all of those are tonight, but there are um, things like personal trauma, which can be singular, non-singular, um, prolonged or a one-off event. And it's based on the individual's internal world, so what, how that individual has experienced that specific trauma. Um, there's cultural trauma, which is the fragmentation of a particular group system of beliefs, which um, can weaken various elements. It can weaken values, beliefs, ideologies of a particular culture. And it's often said that it's the meaning given to that event that actually impacts, um, some impacts um, cultural trauma rather than the event itself for some individuals. And then there's also relational trauma, um, which is, is known as attachment trauma as well. And this um, intertwines with developmental trauma because um, it can interrupt an individual's ability to form a secure and trusting relationship. So if individuals experience insecure attachment during childhood, they might find relationships quite challenging as they get older, and they might lack emotional understanding, um, which is manoeuvred by behavioural and um, emotional responses to attachment-based experiences. The other point I wanted to, to um, touch on before I talk to you about my findings is around the meaning of uh, trauma-informed. So similarly to trauma, being trauma-informed um, trauma lacks um, conceptualisation and it doesn't have a universal definition. So practitioners and organisations construct their own meaning. And this has led to a variety of definitions which exist to interpret trauma-informed practice. It's person-centred, um, it's whole system approach, and it differs from trauma-focused interventions which seek to address underlying trauma. Instead, what it does is it adopts a universal approach promoting safety, trustworthiness, um, support, collaboration, choice and empowerment. It really flips the switch from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you, who is there for you, what matters to you. And Trauma Informed is about embedding a culture of understanding, um, a culture of curiosity and reflection instead of a culture of reaction. It's relational and attachment and connection focused because after all, we're all, connect we're all um, human beings, we crave social connections. Uh, we know the importance of this. The Harvard study on adult development, the longest run running study on happiness, started in 1938 and shows that emotional and mental stimulation is created through person connections which boost our moods and make us happier. So as I mentioned, um, we have our own definition in Wales. We have a trauma-informed practice framework for Wales, the national framework. And within the framework are five practice principles which um, include being a, a universal approach that does no harm, person-centred, relationship-focused, resilience and strengths focused and inclusive. So if we use the animation analogy, 
Being trauma-informed is like being a lighthouse because a lighthouse is a beacon of hope and represents safety uh, to guide our boats through difficult times. And it also lights the way ahead. It empowers us to continue with our journey, um, however that might look, whilst remaining a constant source of reassurance that we can move forward when there's opportunity given to us and where guidance is received if needed. In this way, organisations can be represented as lighthouses, their effectiveness measured by the lens which they apply. Organisations who understand and are responsive to trauma have worked to apply a lens which enables them to undertake various transformations needed at multiple levels whilst constantly reflecting on their mission, their values and their work to ensure a nurturing, sensitive service is felt for all. And in this way, their lighthouse lens can be likened to a Fresnel lens which comprises of tiers of prisms which retract and then reflect the light as it passes through creating a brighter beam. The tiers of prisms represent the importance of multi-level change throughout the whole system whilst the reflection of light symbolises the need for organisations to continually reflect, learn and grow on their journey. And the final thing that I wanted to touch on was the therapeutic relationship. So I believe that you can create a home for people in the relationship that you share with them. You can fill a space with love, character, soul and creativity and you'll be met there with gratitude even if that does take a little while. So the word therapeutic comes from the Greek therapeuin meaning to attend to another. And in this sense a therapeutic relationship is like no other. One individual offers presence, care, compassion, and any act to manifest healing, but expects nothing in return. And this is unlike most personal relationships that we have, which require a mutual balance of give and take. No matter who the individual is, the purpose of the therapeutic relationship remains the same, to connect with another person in order to facilitate their healing. Therapeutic relationships exist in many settings, um, and are often associated with counselling and therapy, but also in healthcare. However, I found in my uh, research that service providers within the youth justice field viewed the relationship that they shared with justice-involved children as therapeutic. There are many hundreds of theories of therapeutic relationships. Um, Carl Rogers put forward one which includes three active components. Um, congruence, which is a condition in a therapeutic relationship that refers to the accurate matching of a person's experience with, an, with awareness, genuineness, authenticity and transparency. So it means understanding their feelings and thoughts accurately. Empathy, so to uh, walk in another person's shoes. <coughs> and unconditional positive regard. So when you have unconditional positive regard for somebody, nothing they could do could give you a reason to stop seeing them as inherently human and indeed inherently lovable. It does not mean that you accept each and every action taken by the person, but that you accept who they are at a level much deeper than surface behaviour. Within a therapeutic relationship, it becomes quite natural for stories to be shared, um, uh, particularly trauma narratives, which I'm going to come back to in a little while. So the title of my talk was Surfing the Waves of Compassionate Accountability. So what do I mean by compassionate accountability? Well, trauma-informed practice is knitting into the fabric of many organisations and spheres, including the criminal justice system, and research does suggest correlation between trauma and those who interface with the criminal justice system. However, confinement within such a system is designed for those who offend rather than those who have experienced adversity. Many practices and procedures which exist within the criminal justice system such as disciplinary approaches, strip searches and restrictional movement may be traumatising or re-traumatising for individuals. And in turn, this can lead to an increase in behaviour reflective of trauma, such as aggression, which can then be really challenging for staff to manage. Trauma-informed practice may be seen as beneficial, however. The challenge lies in managing perceptions of viewing offending via a trauma-informed lens as overly sympathetic whilst disregarding the victim. Instead, the context of offending should be considered alongside trauma histories. Miller and Najavit suggest that despite challenges and careful considerations um, which must be made, trauma-informed practice can enhance the criminal justice environment in terms of safety, result in better outcomes for individuals who interface with the criminal justice um, system and help them to develop pro-social coping skills. 
Trauma-informed culture within um, the criminal justice system does not mean individuals will not be accountable, because they will, but this happens in a compassionate way. So working through a trauma-informed lens means employing gentle curiosity around an individual, their behaviour and responses, and also developing a culture and indeed interventions which support the development of emotional regulation skills and personal ownership of change whilst also contextualising their behaviour. So now I'm going to move on to tell you about some of the findings in my research and there are three themes that I wanted to talk to you about today. So the, thir the first theme is behaviour as communication. So these are some of the quotes taken from participants in the research. Um, this was from a child who I interviewed who said, I was bullied all through primary. I had an abusive dad, an abusive stepdad, and when I was, when I was in my dad's, if I didn't drink with him at a stupid age, I would get beaten up. And this child stated that these experiences were one of the reasons that they started offending in the first place, because they really struggled to manage their anger. They had a lot of anger that had built up from these experiences, and they really struggled with that. So that is how they, that's what they attributed their offending to. And likewise, the second young person um, stated that their pathway began um, on the offending trajectories when their mum went to prison, which triggered a lot of trauma for them. So emotional dysregulation resulting from psychological distress was considered in relation to police call-outs by service providers. They really recognised that children who were presenting as aggressive were actually probably an individual who was really scared, distressed, afraid, um, fearful and anxious. So service providers recognised this um, anger as an outward mechanism for what they were really feeling on the inside. When we're distressed as babies, we cannot self-regulate and we rely on attunement from a regulated and predictable adult to soothe us and get us back into a calm and um, regulated and balanced state. Adolescence, as we all know, is a period of, of massive growth development and where self-soother mechanisms can develop in either a healthy or unhealthy way, depending on our experiences. So these things um, that we do to self-soothe may provide comfort and relief in the short term, but they can be damaging long term. Um, we self-soothe to help us reach equilibrium after a difficult time, but also to get our needs met. So we might not be able to process how we respond to environmental stresses, and so we use avoidant or unhealthy coping mechanisms, which might influence our behaviour or um, stem from emotion, which we're unable to regulate at the time. So as a result of our emotional needs being unmet, we might feel shame, we might feel unworthy, and we might feel unlovable, and so we seek to feel that um, abandonment externally. The construction of behaviour as a form of communication through coping mechanisms has implications for wider understanding and responses to criminal behaviour. For example, if we were to apply a criminological lens, um, whether there's a perceived coping mechanism or not, and where trauma has been experienced, it would allow us to start to understand an individual's behaviour and what they are presenting. Behaviour is already understood as a form of communication, but my thesis adds to the argument that criminal behaviour can also be viewed as a form of communication, signalled as a distress flare of an unmet need. We communicate when we are in survival response, which manifests in various ways, but others around us and we ourselves may not even realise that we're doing it. So, for example, disassociation is an adaptive survival response that allows us to function in survival mode, and it means that we often appear, appear zoned out or relaxed, but internally we're experiencing a severe disconnection from ourselves and others. And sometimes it's because we've experienced dysregulated adult relationships that make us feel not lovable, or we personalise events in order to try and keep that bond. This makes us feel unsafe, and it makes us feel like there's no one there to help us when it makes sense of what is happening to us. Sometimes the trauma that we experience, which is stored in our body, starts to re reveal itself via our relational connections with, with other people. For example, if the love we experience is conditional and taken away based on our behaviour or taken away based on something that we've said, um, then we start to turn, turn into people-pleasing as a safety mechanism in order to protect ourselves. And it's our form response in action where we appease others in order to avoid danger. 
Another theme and finding within my research when creating a trauma-informed culture within youth justice was the importance of viewing the child holistically and forming meaningful connections and relationships with them rather than criminalising them. So some of the children involved in the research considered the relationship with staff as the most important thing, which you can see from the quote on the screen. Um, however, it was appreciated by um, service providers that actually building safe relationship with justice-involved children could be quite difficult and have challenges because children um, might not experience relationships like we experience relationships, and they may have relational trauma and so trust in relationships with adults may feel really uncomfortable and difficult to build. Um, so in, the study, in my study, it was acknowledged by service providers that trauma experienced by um, children might be interpersonal and it might lead to problems regulating emotions for the children, behavioural changes and relational difficulties, which in turn could impede the child-practitioner relationship as well. Some of the children when they were when I was interviewing them they discussed impaired maternal caregiving and this is associated with the relational model of trauma um, so some of this was direct where there was neglect experienced some of it was indirect where the mother was imprisoned and therefore not able to care for the child when trauma is interpersonal it becomes relational and Dr Karen Treesman who's a clinical psychologist and specialist in um, specializing in trauma suggests that healing focused on relational repair, repair must take place where relational trauma has been experienced. So relational practice holds the relationship at the centre of all work by facilitating reliable and supportive connections, whilst also empowering individuals to participate in decision-making processes. This practice gives the opportunity for the building of trust and respect, which engenders feelings of belonging, connection, feeling cared for and valued, and so it acts as a scaffold for future relationship experiences. <coughs> Child First philosophy is advocated within youth justice, and it has four, um, four practices within um, Child First philosophy, so to view children as children, to develop a child's pro-social identity uh, in order to elicit positive outcomes, to collaborate with children and to promote diversion. And this really speaks to trauma-informed philosophy because it advocates a human-centred approach whereby e each aspect of the child is considered and focused upon rather than just simply focusing on their behaviour or their experiences. And the study found that children um, perceived your, um, youth justice practitioners really taking an interest in their lives and also focusing on their strengths rather than simply their behaviour. And service providers, uh, participants, discuss the idea of being child-centred, child-friendly, which suggests an emphasis on ensuring that it remained child-first and viewed children as children rather than labelling them as offenders. At the same time, it was recognised that care had to be given when working through a trauma-informed lens, that um, children were not um, stigmatised and labelled based on their trauma experiences as well. So they weren't labelled as a passive victim or labelled based on research which suggests a correlation between trauma and a negative life trajectory because correlation and causation are two different things. And we're not defined by what's happened to us. These experiences are simply a tesserae in our life's mosaic. <coughs> it's recognised that trauma histories are prevalent in children accessing youth justice and those in custody, and this was reflected in the current study. I didn't ask children about their... Um, personal experiences of trauma, but interestingly, every child that I spoke to opened up and told me their story. So I mentioned therapeutic relationships earlier and how this study concluded that the child-practitioner relationship may be viewed via a therapeutic lens. So when working in a relational and therapeutic way, space is created which allows the, for the sharing of trauma narratives, which can encourage healing for the, chi uh, for the child. Life experiences, both positive and negative, um, move beyond the senses and become organised into stories which help individuals to narrate who they are and reflect on the complexities of their life events. Both children and service providers involved in the study alluded to the crisis management of youth justice 
Um, so they spoke about talking through the challenges, talking through previous trauma, which might lead to emotional catharsis for the children. Um, one of the children in the study discussed how attending youth justice actually really supports their well-being um, because they can discuss issues and they can express their feelings to somebody. But perhaps the most applicable to the child practitioner relationship is the process of being an empathic witness of injustice. For practitioners, this requires providing a space for the child to tell their story and respond in a way which is sympathetic to the moral trauma which has taken place. So allowing space for the child to share their trauma narrative and respond um, to it with understanding and compassion is akin to mooring a boat at the harbour, allowing time to rest, repair and reach a state of e equilibrium before setting off on sail again. Therapeutic relationship, which involves the retelling of um, trauma narratives, has been considered as beneficial with regards to enhancing reflexivity in children and enhancing their self-evaluative um, processes. And this can be particularly youth, useful in youth justice as it can encourage children to reflect and understand their behaviour in relation to what they've experienced, but it can also help them to reframe their adversity as well. So an example from the current study stems from the children's accounts who recognise through their interactions with youth justice, their behaviour and subsequent coping mechanisms, such as substance dependence, might be connected to what they have experienced, uh, which was really interesting. Children also alluded to behavioural change resulting from um, both conversations shared with youth justice practitioners around consequential thinking and collaborative problem solving and also simply the act of youth justice practitioners being present and listening whenever challenges um, arose for them and also in moments of contingency. However, when working in a relational therapeutic way, trauma absorption is a risk to practitioners so clinical supervision may be available to staff via the enhanced case management model, which has been rolled out across um, youth justice teams in Wales. However, practitioners also recognised um, the support within the office amongst staff as beneficial, but they also said that this informal support could not always happen because of the intensive workloads experienced and also um, the time that the time didn't always allow for this to happen. So I want to just talk to you about vicarious trauma, but before I do that, I want to, um, I thought it'd be helpful to consider how we process our experiences. So we all have mobile phones in the room, probably. Um, if we think of the frontal cortex, so the front part of our brain, it's like a vacuum and it picks up everything in its path. Um, some stuff we might not even realise that we are picking it up because we're so young or we might not be consciously aware in the moment. And it involves all of our senses. So... We're consciously aware about 5 to 10 percent. The other 90 percent is subconscious, but that doesn't mean that we aren't processing what we take in in that 90 percent. And it all gets processed in the hippocampus, which is like our brain's phone manager. So it helps us sort and store information. And the experiences that we have are different apps on our phone. And the phone manager sorts and puts away those apps into organised groups. And when they're sorted, it sends a message to our amygdala, which is like the antivirus on our phone. And it tells the rest of our body how to respond to that information. So some information gets processed and stored pretty well, whereas others might end up overwhelming the phone manager and it's unable to be stored. So in that case, the app is just shoved onto the desktop and not stored anywhere. But what that does is it alerts the antivirus system, aka the amygdala, of a threat. So then our amygdala sets off one of our trauma responses. When we experience trauma in childhood, it can turn into those apps on the phone, on the desktop, unable to be stored, meaning that if we experience anything related to that app, directly or indirectly, then our brain will not be able to differentiate between real adversity and perceived adversity, which means that our alarm will be going off all the time um, whenever adversity is perceived, which then amplifies our emotion and dysregulates our behaviours. If this happens too often, um, being unaware of these adverse apps lingering on our phone desktop, we utilise unhelpful stress responses, and they may help in the short term by numbing feelings, for example, but can lead to um, issues long term. So you can see how this can then relate to vicarious trauma, because we may have to support an individual who's experienced something very similar to us, which makes our phone manager panic, 
and sends a stress response to our bodies. So vicarious trauma occurs through a transference of emotional residue from those who have experienced trauma onto those who engage them in an empathic relationship. And vicarious trauma is directly connected to typically detailed and in some cases graphic um, disclosures of trauma. And in that case, negative changes can occur via vicarious trauma, um, including cognitive, emotional and physical changes. Often vicarious trauma is associated with therapeutic and clinical role, uh, roles, um, but it's relevant for youth justice practitioners due to the long-term relationship formed with children, which is holistic and takes into account everything that they've experienced. It's, it is different from secondary traumatic stress. Um, secondary traumatic stress is more common with frontline emergency service workers because there isn't that empathic relationship that is built with individuals, but they are still witnessing trauma firsthand and, and listening to um, trauma narratives as well. So service providers within the study described roles in the youth justice service as counsellor oriented in order to acknowledge and empathise with the child's lived experiences of trauma and also because they create an emotional bond with the child. And so vicarious trauma was alluded to as a potential outcome of a more relational, um, trauma-informed way of working with children and therefore requires careful management and support mechanisms, including supervision and um, informal debriefing between staff in order to enhance and maintain well-being. In the study that I carried out, both supervision and informal debriefing were discussed. However, it was recognised that resourcing implications may influence the delivery of clinical supervision and the fast-paced environment of youth justice may not always allow for informal debriefs to take place as often as required. In relation to this, organisations who do provide intensive support for individuals with trauma histories might start mirroring trauma symptoms, known as trauma-organised. So if we imagine an organisation as a living, breathing being, we can really understand that some um, trauma organised systems can develop because of external or internal dysfunctions and so emotional distress becomes embedded into the culture which results in stress as a segment of its defining feature. Much like us as individuals, um, organisations can display trauma responses so they can <coughs> display fight where conflict might be rife and punitive measures are relied upon to maintain control. Um, they might display flight, where there's an avoidance of certain role um, aspects and absenteeism, and also freeze, which involves a disconnect between colleagues and systems. Practitioners themselves may also be working through a really difficult um, period or may have experiences of trauma which they may subconsciously be struggling with. Um, service providers in the study that I, I conducted um, certainly alluded to their own personal experiences of trauma and adversity. So trauma organised systems might, might respond to stress by implementing more structure, which unfortunately might result in infle <coughs> inflexibility, a culture of blame and negative experiences. Therefore, negative memories are then created and embedded into the organisational scaffold, which paves the way to a stress-inducing rather than a stress-reducing system. So embedding trauma-informed practices within the criminal justice system presents unique challenges due to the organisational culture embodying justice and the historical focus on punishment. However, the benefits of working through a trauma-informed lens should drive changes um, to combat such challenges and help organisations to work towards becoming the lighthouse. So in conclusion, the study found that some offending behaviour is perceived as a strategy to communicate distress which may be through coping mechanisms such as um, substance use, which may lead to altered behavioural states. It may also relate to occasions where powerful emotions are difficult to articulate, therefore expression occurs through behaviour. Um, in order to work through a trauma-informed lens, a cultural shift is required in order to embed um, values, policies and practice across all levels of youth justice. A further practical concept includes the need to work through a child-first and trauma-informed lens, which complement each other through the strengths-based foundation. However, care must be taken not to label from an offending perspective or indeed a, a perspective based on trauma experiences. And the space and relationship shared between children and practitioners involves elements of therapeutic processes and techniques often used by counsellors. 
however, also um, considers with the repercussions of for forming healing relationships, which includes the risk of vicarious trauma, which this study did find to be an important issue and requires addressing at a strategic level in order to adequately support staff and the children that they're working with. So I wanted to end on a quote as I began on a quote. And this is one of my favourite quotes, which bring us back full circle. Um, we are not the survival of the fittest, we are the survival of the nurtured. And I'm grateful to say that I am now being nurtured too. So thank you all so much for listening. <laughs>